Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson with your APTN National News Weekend Edition. With the devastating news of the 215 children being found buried near the former residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia, APTN's Tina House explored the site with a survivor who shared what it was like to be forced to attend that school. A warning, this may be difficult for some of our viewers to hear. The Kamloops Indian Residential School was first established in 1890, and thousands of kids from across BC were sent here. For years, former students told horrific stories about this residential school. Stories of sexual and physical abuse from nuns, priests, and workers, and even stories about how kids just completely disappeared. Now, with the 215 kids that were discovered in a mass unmarked grave, the memorial outside the school is growing by the minute. Rose Miller is almost 80 years old now, and she's a former student here along with many of her other family members. Uh, my dad, Henry, my brother Bobby, my uncle John, my uncle Louis, my cousins and aunts, and, uh, and myself right here. It's been just about 73 years since Rose Miller first walked through those doors as a seven-year-old little girl from Canham Lake, B.C. in 1949. She says she, along with her two brothers, were forcibly removed from their home, and she says it was just the beginning of a total nightmare. It was awful because the food that they fed us for, uh, for breakfast was uh, lumpy, uncooked, mush with sour milk lots of times. The food truck used to come in at 5 in the morning. We could smell all that, that bread and we couldn't have bread half the time and we were so hungry. They'd give us boxes of apples from the apple orchard down here and a lot of times they're all rotten and we're so hungry we've got to scrape out the rotten part of the apple and eat it. At 8 years old, Rose says She'd had enough and ran away along the riverbank as far as she could. I stole some um, paper in an envelope so I could mail a letter to my dad to come and get us. And then we got caught. So they took all, all of us girls who used to play down here on the, on the, by the river here and they took everybody into the dorm and they made us strip down to our panties. There was three of us. Well, we called it bluebirds. That's all they gave us. So then they had a great big strap, it must have been about a quarter of an inch or half an inch. And I just remember the nun pulling up her sleeves like this and jumping and hitting us on the back about 10 times with that strap. And then we had to get our hair cut real, really short and real, real short up here. It was shortly after that brutal beating, Rose and her siblings were picked up by their father to never return after enduring three years of abuse. APTN got exclusive access inside the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, and Rose joined us on a tour of her formal residential school. We had to clean everything. Yeah, some people were punished and they would have to scrub these stairs with a toothbrush. And as she continued to walk the hallways, memories just came flooding back like it happened yesterday as she entered the chapel. This is the heebie-jeebie place, the evil place. This is where the, some of the boys went upstairs to make room for them here. There used to be pews all along here. Girls side, this boy's side, they'd have a file all along here and up there was a, where the priest said the mass and, uh, we were told if we didn't pray we we're going to go burn in hell or the Romans are going to come and rape us and cut our uh, burn our eyes out and burn our hands and our feet and burn off our fingernails so we pray all the harder and that's think this really was hell yeah here in, in this place yeah. this was hell yeah so it was pretty, pretty horrid when you think about how the religion controlled us. Miller isn't surprised by the discovery of the 215 children found buried on the property. She believes there is likely more. Out of respect to the community and the young victims, APTN will not be showing the site where they were found until more ceremonial work is completed. Grief, sadness and sorrow now grip this entire community 
as they come to terms with the fact that 215 children were buried here on this former Indian residential school property. Leaders from across the country are demanding a full criminal investigation, as well as more resources to search every residential school across Canada. Tina House, APTN National News, to Kamloops. Meanwhile, memorials honoring the lives of the 215 children took place across the country over the week. They started in Vancouver, where people placed shoes outside the steps of the Vancouver Art Gallery and quickly spread to cities, communities and towns throughout Canada. Here is some of that. Rows upon rows of shoes line these stairs each one representing the lives of the 215 children who never returned home from the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Over the weekend, large-scale memorials began popping up outside institutions such as government buildings and churches. Following news late last week of the mass gravesite unearthed, artist Tamara Bell decided to set up a memorial on the steps of the Vancouver Art Gallery. I really believe that by creating the visual that we give people context and a place to come and breathe. And shortly after, communities across the country followed suit. In Winnipeg, hundreds of shoes sit outside the Manitoba Legislative Building. The memorial originally started at the Udana Circle at the Forks before it was moved to where a sacred fire will burn for four days. Alia McIver organized the fire and has been staying at the legislative building to help maintain it. We come here in ceremony to honour them, to show them that we care, to show them that they are not alone because the stories that I'm hearing also too is we would have been at home crying alone, we would have been hurting alone. Thank you, thank you for putting this on for us and it's very emotional to, to hear that from elderly people that really suffered all impacts of violence. In Mohawk territory, shoes, toys and flowers make up a memorial outside the St. Francis Xavier Mission Catholic Church in Ganawage. Jessica Erstreich helped organize the memorial. She says she chose the location to help remind the Catholic Church of their role and the atrocities children faced. The Catholic Church is one large entity. So no matter where they are in the country or the world, they are still, every single site is responsible for what happened to those 215 children. For some survivors like Gagayusta Deer, the discovery of the burial site doesn't come as a surprise. It was all over, all over the country. It hit me right inside of me because I knew, I, I, I saw graveyards like that, a graveyard like that, you know. And it's like, oh my God, the people. Similar memorials were set up outside churches in Saskatoon and Whitehorse. In the nation's capital, flags were lowered to half-mast, while passerbys visit a memorial outside Parliament Hill to remember the lives of First Nations children taken too soon. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News. In the Atlantic region, a Mi'kmaq community gathered last weekend to remember the 250 children found buried at the former Kamloops Residential School and to question if children are buried on the grounds of their own former residential school. Angel Moore reports. Elder Ellen Knockwood is a survivor of Shubanagadi Residential School. Sunday evening, he returned to the road that leads up to his old residential school with about 100 other people from Sabaganagadi First Nation. While he smudged, people tied orange ribbons and teddy bears, all in memory of the 215 children buried at former residential school in Kamloops. Whether it happened 100 years ago or last, or last week, we have to recognize that loss and recognize that we are part of that loss as well. And we stand with them. We grieve with them. Up the road from the ribbons and teddy bears is the old residential school. A plastics factory now is at the location. Knockwood says there are children buried at the site. There are three bodies there. Over here is about five. And on the other side of where the school was, on the road I was going to the barn, there's about 10 or 15 more there. What people fail, fail to realize, no, fail to listen. 
According to Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative, ground-penetrating radar has been used to search the area, and no human remains have been found. But they are still looking. Chief Mike Sack has also heard children may be buried at the site and says finding answers is part of healing. Uh, you know, a lot of community members have always said for a long time, and um, I think that we need to make a big push to make sure that we check all of the grounds that are here and, and see what's what, just to uh, put everybody at ease if there is or there isn't. Until more answers are found, makeshift memorials like these will have to do. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Sebaganagadi, First Nation. Time for a quick break. Coming up, the federal government releases the long-awaited MMIWG National Action Plan. Welcome back. It's been two years since the release of the final report of the inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and a year since a national action plan was promised. The federal government and Indigenous organizations presented that plan this week. Jamie Pasha Gumson brings us details and reaction. The online release of the National MMIWG Action Plan was attended by presenters and Indigenous leaders, as well as federal representatives. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau kept on hand the sacred bundle offered to him two years ago at the inquiry's final report ceremony. He said the action plan is a step towards ending a national tragedy. When the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls presented its final report, it called on us to work together to develop a national action plan to end systemic causes of violence. We accepted their findings, including that what happened amounts to genocide. The first steps listed in the report are short-term priorities, such as addressing the root causes of racism, including public education and awareness campaigns, and trauma-informed training for those who work with Indigenous people support for families and survivors, including community-led programs, and stable housing and shelters for Indigenous women and gender-diverse people. This is the first major step for Rebecca Kudlu, president of the Pactutit Inuit Women of Canada. Uh, women um, who are in abusive situations really don't have anywhere to go. Um, and I always bring the fact that uh, if you're being abused at, and it's 40 below out there, where do you go? Even if you try to move to another house where your relatives are, they're overcrowding um, and there's uh, food insecurity. The action plan lists the next steps that must be worked on, including the development of an implementation plan, the creation of an oversight body to define governmental roles and track results, and ensure the continued input and insight of survivors and family members. Denise Pictou Maloney is the co-chair of the National Family Survivors Circle, who were involved to include lived experiences. I'm hopeful, and I have to be, because this is all we have. And um, having the opportunity to sit at the table and to talk about accountability and to make sure that investments are felt on the ground and that there's a mechanism that can make sure that you know that the follow-through is there uh it, it is critical um our women and girls are dying so we need that where the first step was to identify short-term priorities the implementation plan will develop medium to long-term strategies the next stage in the process is expected to be released this fall jamie pashagum scum ap10 national news ottawa Manitoba advocates and family members from the Coalition for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls has shared their thoughts on the National Action Plan during a special virtual event in the province where Tina Fontaine's murder sparked the MMIWG movement. The reaction is mixed. The coalition has previously critiqued the national inquiry, calling the process flawed, and at one point calling for the resignation of commissioners. Following the release of the National Action Plan, Coalition members said the report was vague, but it was a step in the right direction. I wish it was a reflection of everything that I see going on in those circles with the women and, you know, um, the working groups that are out there, the coalition members, the non-Indigenous-led you know, organizations. I wish um, 
the report was similar to all of that, you know, that work that we're advocating for and working hard towards and hopefully one day it will be. I don't know that it fully addresses the whole, all the 231 calls for justice in a way that is needed in a way that is meaningful and in a way that creates space for everybody at that grassroots level. So it, I think it's, it's a good start. It's those first steps. In Saskatchewan, local advocate Darlene Okimasum Sakote says the MMIWG National Action Plan has good points and bad points. Okimasum Sakote is the co-chair of the Saskatoon-based group Women Walking Together. She says more work still needs to be done, but the focus of the plan is encouraging. Just taking a glance of um, the document, that I'm really happy with the four areas that they're focusing on. Justice, um, wellness, um, human security, you know, all those other, other goodies. I'm really, really liking that they're wanting to do an oversight body as well. They shut down the streets to call for justice for Joyce. Hundreds, possibly thousands of Indigenous people gathered Wednesday in Trois-Rivières to mark the official end of the Echequan Commission, the coroner's inquiry examining systemic racism in Quebec's healthcare system. Our Lindsay Richardson was there. Three weeks of hearings, dozens of testimony heard, and it has culminated to this moment. 1,500 people or more from Manawan and nations all over Quebec gathered together to march peacefully towards the Palais de Justice and cry out justice for Joyce one last time before the Commission's work really begins. He didn't plan to speak, but the crowd gave Kawazube courage. Everyone is here for Dubé's late wife, Joyce Echequan, and to keep up the pressure on those holding power in Quebec. À compter de maintenant. Aujourd'hui, c'est la journée, c'est le jour 1 de la fin du racisme, puis c'est le jour 1 du début de la justice pour tous au Québec. C'est comme ça qu'on nous... On veut vivre cette journée. And supporters heard that call from far and away. We did a two, two days to be here. We took a train and we took a car. And uh, it's very important for us to be here with them because it's, a, it's a important cases and we have to stop it. I am afraid because I am Innu. I am afraid from uh, the kids. I am afraid from uh, them. Because of a high demand, the Innu community of Iquanishit held a lottery to decide who would attend Wednesday's march. Carrying the flag for the nation, their vice chief had this message. I demand that the government recognize that there is a racist system everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Chez les hôpitaux, mais dans le système des hôpitaux, puis les centres jeunesse également aussi chez nos jeunes, euh, partout, partout. The Joliet situation is not an isolated situation. It goes far beyond Joliet, and I think it really in the, it's in the hands of the government now to take action. Despite the province's holdout, this group took action of their own, shutting down the main streets to drum, to sing, to dance, and to heal. And of course, to keep up the cry that's echoed for the last eight months. Over the last three weeks, we've heard accounts of indignity, of humiliation and neglect. The gathering of nations ensures, moving forward, that Joyce Ashaquan will rest with honor. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Trois-Rivières, Quebec. This week, Bradley Barton was scheduled to be sentenced in the death of Cindy Gladue, but Barton's lawyer has filed for a mistrial. The reason behind the mistrial application is under a publication ban. If Justin Stephen Hillier grants the mistrial, Barton would face his third trial in the death of Cindy Gladue. Barton has admitted to causing the injury that led to Gladue's death. Coming up, following the news out of Kamloops, a controversial school name is out for one school in Calgary. More on that after the break.
in Calgary, a sign of change. For years, a committee has been after the Board of Education to have the name of the Langevin School replaced. Langevin was one of the creators of residential schools. But now, after the tragedy in Kamloops and a shock art piece created outside of the school, the Board has announced a new name. Tamara Pimentel has a story. After sundown, footprints were spray-painted and banners hung outside of Calgary's Langevin School. Monday morning, the public woke to this demonstration, demanding for the name Langevin to be removed. He was an architect of the residential school system. By Tuesday, the Calgary Board of Education announced the school is now called Riverside School. My hope is, is that the community and I think all of Canada now understand the gravity of what we're talking about when we talk about truth and reconciliation. Michelle Robinson is part of a committee spearheaded by non-Indigenous allies. For years, they've been after the board to have the name Langevin removed, but were shut down. APTN interviewed grade 8 students Joy McCullough and Zach Helfenbaum in April. It makes me feel sad that like to this day there's still like a school that was named after someone like that. It, if I were Indigenous and I had to walk into a school that had something like this name, I'd feel very sad and angry. In a statement, the Board of Education said the tragic discovery in Kamloops and the reaction shared by Canadians has emphasized the importance of reconciliation. Kat Schick of the renaming committee says although the students have been turned down in the past, now is the time to remove names like Langevin. It's exactly the right time to do it, to um, show the public that there are people here that care about reconciliation, that care about survivors and victims of residential schools, and care that our institutions are named after people who actually promoted this horrible institution. Riverside School was the original name before being changed to Langevin. The Calgary Board of Education says it will be considering changes to policies regarding renaming at a meeting later this month. Tamara Pimentel, ABTN National News. Calgary. That's all your APTN National News for this weekend edition. For more Indigenous news, visit aptnnews.ca and on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and TikTok at APTN News. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a good rest of your weekend.